We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is past guest of the show, Warren Irwin, President and CIO of Razo Asset Management. How are you today, Warren? I'm great, Tom. Thanks for having me. Excellent to have you back on the show. I know I personally haven't spoken to you before, but like I say, a past guest of the show. And of course, you have a lot of experience in the you know, really the, the the entire resource sector, and we're going to get to a bunch of different points around that. But I'd maybe like to start by hearing about a story that the gold industry is somewhat infamous for. You were an investor in the Briex scandal, in a way. And if you could tell us about how you saw that story develop and what some of your key takeaways you learned from that time. Yeah, the, the Briex story for me was uh, quite a watershed uh, in that I was pretty young. I was right out of MBA school. And I was new to the mining business. So I learned an absolute lot in a very, very short period of time. And the fascinating part of it too was I had, I made millions and millions of dollars when I was really young back, you know, a few decades ago when millions and millions of dollars meant a lot more than it does today. And so it was a very, very super exciting time for me. And I learned a massive amount of lessons that would serve me well uh, in my, in the last number of decades I've been investing in the mining sector. So maybe let's start with how that company kind of came onto your radar and how you started investing in it and what clues started kind of coming to you that started to be maybe some red flags. Yeah, well, you know, I was um, I was working uh, as a director in the proprietary trading at Deutsche Bank at the time. And uh, one of the traders there had told me, uh, Warren, I have a friend of mine who's a broker. He's long up, uh, really long this um uh, the stock called Briex is really exciting. It's a new gold discovery in in Equi in sorry in Indonesia, and interestingly enough, I just a few years earlier I just spent some time in Indonesia. So, unlike many Canadians, I, I knew the company country reasonably well, and I spent uh, a, a good amount of time there. I think it was almost a month, and I also had one of my former profs from MBA school had left uh, Western where I went to to school and. Um, and got my MBA. So he went to teach at the business school in, in Jakarta. So he was, uh, he was pretty cool. And he was, he hosted me there and, and uh, lent me his car and driver for the day to poke around uh, Jakarta. So I got to know Indonesia fairly well. And a few years earlier, I also did a quick and dirty valuation of a gold project up in Northern British Columbia. So I was just starting out. I knew a fair amount about Indonesia and I saw the wealth that was being created there. So that was exciting. And I'd also spent some time looking at some uh, early stage gold properties in Northern BC. So I was just getting my feet wet at the time. So I had a lot to learn. Yeah. And, so uh, when you started learning more about the project, I believe you, you even traveled to site and then from your obviously listening to the story before there were some points that that people had made to you about why that it might not be all it was cracked up to be and and you know how do you go about thinking about those counterpoints and and pieces of information when you when you do believe in a story let's say yeah yeah well how it developed for me is it's it's no different than any any story in many of these resource stories it Things are going really, really great. There's a lot of momentum. Then all of a sudden, there's, people start to question things, and then boof. You know, it's a typical junior cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So, for the first year or so when I was trading it, um, it was clear everything was bullish. BMO was uh, had their their lead analyst was all over it. Every analyst on the street was clamoring to get on it. It was in the front page of the Global Mail, the Financial Post, which is something you don't see anymore today because they they pretty much burned so many people. I think the newspapers are very hesitant to cover juniors anymore, but it was front page story in Canada for sure. And everybody was talking about it and everybody was going the same way. And uh, I eventually had made so much money. I'd started with um, 80 grand saved up to buy a house. And then I turned that into a quarter of a million dollars on a, on a distressed real estate uh, publicly traded company. So I had a quarter of a million dollars. I plunked it all into Briex. So up near the top, you know, like I was, 
I was looking at many millions of dollars. Um, I bought in around 18 bucks and the high was around 280. So I was up some good dough. I also bought some on margin, about a million bucks margin. So at one point, things are going very, very well. And I said, you know, um, I'm burning up the phone lines, $1,500 a month phone bills to Jakarta to keep on top of things. I really need to get down there. So I tried to get on a, a mining trip there, but the trip was already all fully booked up. And I said, you know, they're going to have a way tougher time saying no to me if I just jumped in a plane, flew to Jakarta, sat in front of the, sat in the office and said, hey, I'm here. Mm-hmm. Any room in the trip to go to to um, Balak Papan and or Balak Papan or Borneo and um, fly into site. So I did that, I had a bit of a risk, and um, sat there in the office with uh, the office manager. My recommend, rec- uh, recollection, his name was Greg. I took him out for lunch, took him out for dinner, or said, so what are the odds of me getting on a trip? He said, Warren, there's zero chance. And he said, all the helicopters going into site were full. And I'd already had a plan B to, to rent a riverboat uh, and take me up the Mahakam River and then buy some kid's motorcycle when I reached the port of Laura Dury and just ride in because I'm a former uh, motorcycle racer. So I, I cross country motorcycle riding is not a big deal. So I've had plan B already. So that's fine. And he says, but you know, there's a, there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting presentation being given by Mike de Guzman uh, and, um, and uh, John Felderhoff in the Balak Papan prior to uh, departure for the site. So I flew, you know, from Jakarta again to Borneo again with no permission to go on site. And I asked Mike, and uh, I asked Mike, I said, Mike, any chance we get on a helicopter? He goes, Nope, they're all full. I said, Okay, well, I'll be here for the presentation. I went out for some beers that night. Some interesting stuff happened that night. Um, it's written. <laughs> I wrote an article for CEO.ca. If you ever want to read it, it's a good summary of my experience. It's uh, so if you Google Warren Irwin in Briex. There's an article. It's four pages long. Probably the chock full of information about uh, about what you learned to protect yourself and learn at my expense from uh, mining scams. So I went there. Sure enough, next morning I woke up and go, "Hey, Mike, any room in the helicopter?" Sure enough, one guy forgot, lost his passport and was sent home. So there was one spot, and I got the last spot. And then I spent, um, I think it was a night or two in in sight, um, and was asking tough, tons of questions. Went around, learned a whole bunch. And when I got back, I had a few questions. And the real the real thing that helped me a ton is I ran into a, an old miner, believe it or not, in the elevator of my condo building back in Toronto. And I we were just chatting about uh, Briex because it was on the front page of the Financial Post that day. And I said, oh, yeah, I just came back from here. And he said, you and I need to go for lunch. So we went out for lunch. And he explained uh, probably about you know, 20, 30 reasons why he believed it was a fraud. Mm-hmm. And I had 20 or 30 reasons as to why, uh, logical reasons why what he said was incorrect. And, but, you know, to me, when you have that many points, pros and cons, you got to be concerned. That was, that had me quite concerned. So I started, I started to turn at that point. Um, and, uh, and then when I was on site, I was suspicious enough, even before I met uh, the guy who's Dale Hendrick, a real, an old season mining guy, uh, that, I'd already asked things like I'd ask uh, John Felderhoff, when are you going to be twinning the holes and things like that? And and when September, when he said they were twinning the holes, came and went and that didn't happen, I realized that there, a couple of things were happening that I wasn't super pleased with. But, you know, the local geos, I found some former uh, Canadians who worked at uh, Briex who had started the new mining companies and they they'd worked on site as geos and they said, wait, everything's fine. Warren, there's no, they, they didn't, they were geos working for the company and everything was fine there. And all the locals were fooled. They were building homes around the site. So they were fooled. So it was a very good scam. So um, just as time went on, um, I started getting increasingly suspicious. And eventually um, when uh, de Guzman, you know, allegedly, uh, was left the helicopter and fell to his death. That uh, that was a turning point for me. And uh, fortunately for me too, I was also building a Briex mansion. And my builder Tony had asked me for a whole bunch of money, so I sold half my stock at the peak because uh, I want to make sure Tony got paid, and I want to take myself off margin. I want to make sure I had money for my taxes. So fortunately, that was the best sale. It wasn't because I was smart; it was because 
Tony needed money. And so, so then the, the last bit of it I sold when Mike the Guzman jumped out of the plane or fell or whatever he did. Um, it's, uh, and then uh, I went short. And that was, you know, t- talk about a, a, a mental games. Uh, the article talks about the mental games. And um, there were a lot of things going on. And I was short the stock and I had put options on, on Briex. And it was quite a, a mental exercise. And um, at some points, there were sort of rumors that uh, Jim Bob Moffat had a free port, had resigned in the stock. I was shorted. It quadrupled in my face. That's never good. <laughs> it, was quite a, it was quite an adventure, quite a treat. And I met a lot of interesting and exciting characters throughout the, uh, the, the few years that I was involved in it. And uh, fortunately, I came... Uh, came away with my skin still attached to my body. A lot of people didn't. There were people who committed suicide, uh, people I know who couldn't deal with the stress and um, of losing all their money. And, you know, there, and, you know, obviously when I started getting suspicious, I shared my suspicions with other people and the believers, it, it was a very good lesson on, on greed. Because a lot of people would not believe anything I said, and they were actually quite hostile towards me, and I received quite a number of threats in, um, when I did turn negative. So after a while, I said, well, you know, I'll call all the people I got into the stock, which were about 40 of them. Of the 40, 38 people sold when I did, and uh, two of them thought they were smarter than me and thought it was going way higher. I tried to convince them out of it. They didn't, so they went down with the ship. But a lot of p- good people I know that I tried my very best to convince to sell would not sell because the greed machine was just too great. Mm-hmm. And I have not seen that level of greed in the markets uh, since the mid nineties in the resource sector. It was something to behold for sure. So stepping back now, and obviously having many years to kind of digest the lessons from that for the average person that doesn't have the resources to be able to travel to site and get on a bike and not worry about riding into site if they had to. How do you think about analyzing some of these companies? Is that something that's necessary is is going to site or can you do some analysis now with obviously more information available about everything? Is it easier to do that type of investigation now? It is way easier now, for sure, for sure. When I was uh at Deutsche Bank, for me to get press clippings, I would have to go to the see, you know, go to a, a library we had a deal with, and I'd go there and be photocopying press clippings. And they they had a lady at the library that would, uh, you know, clip all the Briex articles and put them in a file, and I'd have to go there and photocopy them all, then bring them back. That was, you know, <laughs> these days is quite a bit easier than it used to be. And also, um, you know, it was just the start of having online chat sessions and. For those of you in, interested in really getting into Briex, the online chat sessions from Briex remain online. So you'll see my words and you'll see the words of others from 1995, 96, 97. And you could see the greed and how anybody who, who wanted to crush the dream was beat up by a lot of people. And um, so that still goes on today. Like try try being negative on uranium, right? Like. <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm not mm-hmm. negative on uranium, but yeah. I'm not as bullish as the the bulls are. So, <laughs> and I get beat up pretty bad on that because um, the bulls want to believe, right? So, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, but the greed, uh, the greed in the mid '90s in the resource sector, unbelievable. And part of the reason for that is there was just a four billion dollar win with Robert Friedland with Boise's Bay, right? So, people were sitting with uh, billions of dollars in their pockets in a very small Bay Street. And they were just heaving it into these juniors. And it was quite an exciting and interesting time. It taught me a lot about greed. Mm-hmm. I have not seen that level of greed since then. So w- when you maybe see that that type mm-hmm. of greed and all those, those feel-good emotions are confirming everyone's bias, is that a, <laughs> a perfect example of when you start looking at profits now? Is that just your kind of your knee-jerk reaction now? You know, if I was mentoring a young new investor, Tom... If there's any one lesson I would say to them, I would say, whenever you feel really, really smart and really, really good about your investments, sell. And or or you don't need to sell everything all at once, but just mm-hmm. as you start getting a big ego, thinking this is easy, thinking you're really smart, you know, you're really smart, 
uh, I can't believe everybody doesn't do this. Then you sell a little bit, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, maybe sell a quarter. And then a couple months later, sell another quarter. And uh, that has uh, served me very well. I remember uh, I did that when uh, in, in the resource sector, probably about 10 or 15 years ago, I was up huge money. And I said, you know, I'm feeling too good. I'm feeling too smart. I'm not this smart. <laughs> so I, so I uh, you know, pro- took a whole bunch of money off the table. And then I built a house. and my my second big home. Uh, And um, what was exciting about that, interesting about that is, had I not sold to buy buy real estate, uh, my investments went down about 80 to 90%. Despite owning what I thought were really good investments, they Mm -hmm. they collapsed. So, you know, um, whenever you're feeling good, things are rocking, you're really smart, things are easy. I don't know why everybody doesn't do this. Sell. (laughs) <laughs> a little bit okay and uh and uh yeah so that's uh because that's not the way the markets work as you know mm-hmm. uh, the markets are, are are a very treacherous place and um they they eat people for lunch so you've got to be got to be careful when good times happen you celebrate those by letting a little bit go and uh put something in the bank and you perhaps buy some real estate or something outside of this outside of the sector for a while or sit on some cash mm-hmm. So as you as you mentioned, you know, one of the most let's say bullish sectors in this in this resource space is kind of the uranium space. So how do you see let's say the the case for this giant uranium bull that just hasn't quite progressed? You you aren't necessarily relying on a parabolic rise in the spot price. So lay out maybe the conventional thinking for the bull case for uranium, and then we can kind of contrast your ideas about it. Okay, yeah. Okay, so why don't we just talk on a, on a top-down basis? Um, I've made a lot of money in uranium in the last, you know, six years. I've made about a hundred million dollars for my fund, which is a good chunk of change. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know many other people have done that. I'm sure there are other people, so don't beat me up. If there's like some fund that bought ten percent of Cameco and Cameco went up, you know, whatever, and but I, I made it through next gen, and I made it not speculating on the price of uranium. I made it on um, on a new discovery. And when I look at uh, how much money I've made in the last you know twenty plus years, like twenty three, twenty four years managing funds at Rosso Asset Management, over half our money we've made has been in precious metals, mostly virtually all gold, right? Mm-hmm. And how much of that? Money we made in gold was speculating the price of gold. It was zero. Every nickel I made in the gold market was based on fundamentals on a discovery of a new gold project. And every nickel I made in in next gen or in the uranium space is the exact same way. It's not speculating that, oh, uranium is going to go to $140 a pound again. So that's the first takeaway there. And frankly, I personally do not know too many people who have made money speculating on the price of gold and i'll get into it uh i'll get into it more a little bit there but let's say on uranium what's happening right now in uranium is and i was i i fell for some of the bull case about six seven years ago when i was on palisade and i talked about you know we could have a rip your face off uranium rally mm-hmm. um the, the quick bull case for it is there's about 180 million pounds of uranium used a year and maybe 140 produced so about 40 million pounds made up a secondary supply that's been floating around the market and it's getting eaten up. And so the bulls are saying now with ESG and people are finally recognizing uh, the power of uranium for non-CO2 generating baseload. And, and now we started to see some spectacular failures in wind and solar. And people know we cannot count on wind and solar to, produce, to power our society in the future, right? It has to be nuclear. And finally, the clowns are figuring that out. Like, you know, Al Gore, I talked to him years ago at the TED conference and said, what about nuclear and the re- renewables? And he looked as if I had three heads because he was being, he was pumping up the wind and solar. And anybody with half a brain knows that's not going to work. And um, you need nuclear power. You just do the mathematics on how much power the world needs and power the growth and demand for power as people get, start moving from the country into the cities. As we start switching to, you know, electric cars, there's not a hope we're going to power it through wind and solar. So I'm a huge bull on 
uranium, nuclear power, and um, and there is a deficit, so people are all excited about that. So, but unfortunately, over the last six years, seven years, that 40, 000, 40 million pounds a year has been made up by secondary supply, which when you add it up seven years times 40 million pounds, it's a pretty big number. And then you throw in that, you know, Sprott and Yellow Cake have bought another uh, Sprott through the rest, the Spot, uh, Sprott Uranium Trust, have bought roughly 60 million pounds, and Yellow Cake has bought another 20 million pounds. You add that to the 280 million pounds, and <laughs> You know, you've got hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, arriving on the market uh, in secondary supply. Now people are saying all the secondary supply is gone. Sprott has gone in there with their 60 million pounds, cleaned up the spot market. And everybody's finally realized that uranium is the place to be because nuclear power is the future. And there you have it. That's the bull case, right? And um, the only way I could temper that a little bit is there, you know, chemicals spooling up MacArthur River. That's 15 million pounds a year. The Kazakhs are still, I think, running about 10% less than the, I know they did a 20% production cut. I think that's still at around minus 10% production cut. So that could be another several million, many million pounds coming onto the market if they go back to their old production levels, let alone crank up production. And, you know, the Kazakhs have probably one of the lowest cost productions because they're using in situ recovery. So they're around sub $10. Next gen, when they put their 30 million pounds on in the market and later this decade, uh, their costs will be all in sustaining costs will be around 10 bucks. But people are saying, we're going to get 140. So, well, you know, if the two biggest producers, which will be at the time NextGen and uh, Kazanoprom, their cost of production is ten bucks. Wow, that's quite a that's quite a reach to to say that you need one hundred and forty to make up any additional supply. So, um, the reason I'm not a believer in that is that um, you know at seventy five dollars, people say, well, you need seventy five dollars to uh, to encourage any future new mine production. Mm -hmm. Well. Every single project I've looked at in the entire world is economic at $75. So there you have it. So we're at 50 now. Big deal. It goes to 75. People start building uranium mines. Next Gen comes on stream. MacArthur River comes on stream. Kazakhs stop their production cuts and start growing production. And that little 40 million pound in thing will, you know, deficit will get made up pretty quickly. And then, you know, the black hole, and nobody can give anybody a straight answer on this. This is the big unknown: is is there another five hundred million pounds floating around that's going to hit our market? So mm -hmm. that's why I don't share the big super duper enthusiasm everybody has for uranium. Uranium is a just smart just for the 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 spot price really running up to you know over a hundred dollars, right? Yeah, well, well, they could run it to to over a hundred dollars for sure, for sure, right? And mm -hmm. My advice to anybody if they start doing that is to sell into it. And that's what I'll be doing. The um Warren, maybe bef before we move on, just to yeah. interrupt you for a sec. You know, obviously the the counter argument against that would be that there's this lag time for all this other supply coming online. So how do you see that? You know, what is that lag time and how how quickly can that deficit be made up? Yeah, see that's uh well, we know next gen's coming with 30 million pounds. When that is, is later this decade. And we know MacArthur's starting up, and we know the, uh, the Kazakhs at some point will stop, will crank their production up to what it used to be. But the Kazakhs are probably the biggest swing producers. They could get an ISR in, into production in probably about a year. Mm -hmm. And I, I spoke with the CEO, the former CEO of Kazataprom some years ago. And he said, Warren, you give me 100 million bucks, we'll crank up production. He was totally jacked. And he says, uh, we will meet production, no problem. You just tell me how much you need and we'll do it. So that was his viewpoint now. Perhaps they're a little bit more market discipline. But what we have here now is with the Sprott Uranium Trust, which is frankly a trust, nobody will say this, but it's a trust meant to squeeze the market. Like mm -hmm. simple, it's plain and simple, right? Like why else? There's no common sense reason why you would run into, run around the world buying up all the Sprott Uranium and then store it like it's... There's no, it's not common sense other than you think that by doing that, we're going to get tighten up the spot market. 
And then uh, th there'll be a supply deficit will be there. And maybe if the secondary supply dries up a bit, we can get things running. And so that could very much, that could very well happen if you get a big hedge fund out of the US, it's you know, 10 or $20 billion hedge fund, and they decide to throw a billion dollars at, at uh, Sprout Uranium Trust or a few billion dollars at it, they could change, they could make me completely and totally wrong, right? And we could be going for that hype for people who, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, are bullish on the uranium sector, they'll throw a ton of money in the spot, they'll go into the market, there's nothing in the spot market, they'll ramp the spot market to, to whatever level it takes to get the get the cash in. So that's sort of the situation there. And um, so I'm not as bullish as everybody else. Everybody, like I've heard some real nonsense, frankly, out of the, some of the uranium bulls. They're talking about, you know, I want, Warren, I want to build some generational wealth in uranium. And everybody's looking at, you know, that one little peak we had where uranium went to 140 back 2007, 2008. And everybody's expecting that to happen again. And when everybody expects that to happen again, it never happens. So uh, just a little word of caution there. And so how am I playing it? Uh, I'm playing it by by owning some next gen. It's a high quality name. If uh, Sprott is uh, able to corner the market um, better than it has thus far, uh, and the market continues to tighten up, and uh, you know you, they run uranium to 100 bucks a pound, I'll be selling my next gen. If that does not happen, next gen will gradually rise in price as they move closer and closer to production. So um, I, that's probably, the, in my opinion, the, the safest and smartest way to play uranium. But there's a lot of pundits out there who are long up the wazoo, um, a whole bunch of crappy uranium stocks. And they're dying for $100 uranium because they're going to throw that uranium right back in your, in, in the, you know, to unsuspecting investors' faces. And uh, when it's 100 bucks, they say, well, we're going to go to 140 just like we did last time. We're going to break the all-time high. We're going to hit $200. And that's when you you don't fall for that, and you just sell into it. So that's what I'm going to be doing, and uh, I hope many of your listeners will will follow that and have big smiles on their faces um, when that happens. But that's that's the game. The gates games tighten the market, run it up, and a lot of people will be offloading a lot of junk onto unsuspecting investors, which uh, you know, which is what they did last time. There was, mm -hmm. there was we got to like probably 400 stupid uranium juniors when gold when uranium was at 140 so and a lot of people got burned because you know out of that 400 let's say uh 390 went to zero mm -hmm. so it, so warren uh, in, instead of waiting let's say you know you're you're obviously not a bear on the on the uranium sector but you just take a different way or a different approach of actually trying to capitalize off of that market so how do you look at picking some of these higher quality equities to be able to capitalize on that market. Yeah, well, you know, in the in the uranium space, there, there's so few high quality names that I just I'm just going to be lazy and stick with next gen and uh they have a big uh they have a big event and, and it's called, you know, firing up their production and as soon as that happens it won't be uh, it won't be a play as a percentage of their nav. It'll be a it'll be a multiple of their cash flow, and mm -hmm. you know the amount of money next gen can make here is pretty extraordinary. So that's sort of the one I like. There there are other ones out there that are uh, you know less blue chip, um, and uh, then then there's there's a tier of probably you know three or four that are a little bit less blue chip, and then there's a whole sea of junk uh, that is um which will never 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 see production ever so that's the stuff that it's great to to own the junk now and a lot of guys are probably buying the junk and hoping to sell the junk when the market runs because those are the ones you're going to get the many multi-baggers on but if it uh if we don't get the big run in uranium you're also not going to get the big uh you're, you're going to end up with a, a pile of junk right that's wrong mm -hmm. yeah you mentioned speaking with with Al Gore, you know, really promoting wind and solar. And I remember you, you mentioned that Greenpeace is is kind of in that bucket too. So why do you think that they're so anti nuclear? What drives their their incentives there? Well, you know, I, I'm reasonably old, <laughs> and I was around in the '70s with a hysteria around Three Mile Island, and you know, the Greenpeace 
activists going against nuclear power. And they're still kind of dopey and they're still anti-nuclear, even now, even now that it's clear that it's the only way to power the world. And uh, my biggest beef with 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 uh, Greenpeace is that as a direct result of Greenpeace, we've been burning coal for half a century and in a large part because of Greenpeace and lobbying the government about the dangers of nuclear power. They have uh, set back nuclear power, you know, research as as much as half a century. So, you know, can you imagine the small modular reactors we'd have today if we had if we'd been actually been pro nuclear for the past fifty years from the seventies? In the nineteen seventies, that was the biggest nuclear power plant build out the world has ever seen, till till recently with the Chinese. But that was the American nuclear power build out, mm-hmm. and. Um, Greenpeace played a big role in shutting that down. So what did we do for the last 50 years? We did the safe thing, right? Which is burn coal and killed a whole bunch of people prematurely and polluted the earth and created this much of the CO2 problem we have today. So thank you, Greenpeace, for your uh, your environmental damage. And today, here we are again. Greenpeace still hasn't figured out that nuclear power is our only hope for society. Um, so they're, uh, that's sort of my thoughts on Greenpeace. You and I spoke, I believe, last week, and you were kind of mentioning to me that instead of, you know, having these Gen 4, Gen 5 reactors that cost billions and billions of dollars to build, and a lot of that cost is associated with the, let's say, the custom design, what is your, you know, thinking around what the solution to that could be? Yeah, well, the the key there is the unique thing about, let's take a look, compare two things. Let's compare a nuclear reactor versus a... um, uh, a uh, natural gas power plant. Natural gas power plant, let's say, I'm just going to pull a number out, 80 to 90% of the cost of the power is power of the nat- is the cost of the natural gas, right? So it, it, it has quite a bit of a swing. And the good thing about it is you can power them up, power them down. So they're, they're good for swing, uh, swing electrical production. That's natural gas. Uranium and nuclear power is unique in that um, 90 plus percent the cost of nuclear power is the plant, the capital, and it's capital intensive. And uh, the price of uranium, and this is why the bulls get all excited. They go, well, it doesn't matter to utility um, if the price of uranium is $50, $50 a pound or $100 a pound because it's only 5% or, or single digit percentages of the cost of the power. Mm-hmm. And that's indeed the case. And that's uh, that is indeed uh, one of the one of the bull cases for uranium. So, if so, the key there is given the cost structure, your biggest um, the biggest way to reduce the nuclear the cost of uh, electricity generated with nuclear power is to reduce the capital cost, and the best way to do that is through standardization and modularity. So, the uh, you don't need a small modular reactor, but you just need modular reactors where you know you'll have a a reactor that would would say instead of in the old days saying well we want a 1.3 gigawatt power plant to in the future saying well you want a 1.3 gigawatt tell you what why don't we give you four 1.43 megawatt mm-hmm. plants we'll put in series it'll almost get you there and if you and as you grow into that power we could put another one on that'll take you to 1.5 so modularity will be the key to um to the acceptance the increased acceptance of of nuclear power. Uh, the other thing about modularity is like, so So when I mean modularity, that means many of the parts are standardized versus how nuclear power plants have been built in the past. They, they do a clean slate and a custom build right from the beginning. Mm-hmm. So that's where the biggest biggest excitement is. And that's where people are, um, are looking at it. And what I like about the Gen 4 uh, small modular reactors, for instance, is that their fuel is in some instances or molten? Let's say an example of a let's say a molten salt one is that your fuel is already has been melted down, and you need power put into the reactor to keep the process within the reactor, the fission going. So if the power is cut, like what happened at Fukushima, the process just slows down, and and if your fuel is already in liquid form, you can't really have a meltdown. So there are a number of safety features in the Gen 4s that I really, really like over the current generation or previous generation of the light water reactors. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, I'm a I'm a citizen of the earth and I want what everybody wants, which is cheap, clean power that's safe. 
And nuclear power has proven to be one of the most safe baseload power. I think fewer people have been killed in, as a result of nuclear power accidents than than hydro. In hydro, there have been enough dams breaking, wiping out villages downstream. So nuclear power, I believe right now, is the safest uh, baseload power based on you know many, many decades uh, of uh, power production. Mm-hmm. I'd like to move to your your thinking around, let's say the the bull case for gold. You know, you 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 think about this much differently than a lot of the, let's say, the people in the industry that are waiting for a, a massive gold run or a massive uranium run. So, do you look at you know really trying to capitalize on gold equities the same way, regardless of what the gold price itself does? Yeah, I'm trying to. I in my entire career, I've been gold price agnostic, and I don't really spend a lot of time thinking if we're in a bull market or bear market for gold, right? Uh, and that served in me That served me very, very well. I just try and find really good companies that are finding the next big gold discoveries, and that served me very well. And I'd encourage anybody looking at investing in the gold market to do the same. It's worked very well for me, and I don't know where it's worked for anybody trying to guess the price of gold because the price of gold um, – uh, seems to be random, randomly up and down, and everybody gets, you know, anybody trying to predict the price of gold gets laid out from what I can see and what I've been, uh, I've experienced in, in my many decades in the business. So uh, I remember when I was younger, starting out trying to understand the gold market, and I'd hear guys like Rob McEwen saying five thousand dollar gold, and you know, and other people are saying three thousand dollar gold. And this is back when gold was, you know sub 1000 i said well you know rob McEwen must really know what he's talking about well he because he uh he's made a lot of money in the gold market but you know rob rob made it in in red lake with uh with gold corp right and um he didn't make it so doing any huge futures thing predicting the price of gold and rob was talking his book right so what i've noticed over the years is there are a lot of pundits out there in the market that are trying to get people running run the price of gold up run the price of gold down but it it's all around this trend line that seems to be going like this an ounce of gold today will buy you a suit and the ounce of gold will buy you a suit back you know 100 years right Mm -hmm. and i bet you if you went back to the the vikings an ounce of gold would buy a nice suit of armor right so gold has had a pretty constant purchasing power so if I give advice to people, so how do you make money in the gold market? We say, well, first of all, don't predict the price of gold. Like it's a waste of time. Try and find good juniors that are going to make the next big discoveries. That's how you make money. That's how I've made money, and that's why I'm still in business today. And uh, but if you start trying to predict the price of gold, it's kind of ridiculous because the price of gold seems to track this this level of inflation over the the millennium. And sure, gold gets above this trend line and sometimes gets below the trend line and people try and predict that, but that's super duper tricky to predict, right? Like who would have thought, uh, you know, threat of nuclear war with uh, with Russia and uh, you'd think gold would be like 20,000 an ounce today, but it's not. And guess what? Those predictions by Rob McEwen were completely and totally outrageous looking in hindsight with considerably more experience than I had at the time when I listened to his projections. Um, the reality is at $5,000 gold, every single property in the entire world that I've ever set foot on, uh, that's a gold property would be economic, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so you would triple the number of gold mines in the world at $5,000 gold. I just pulled a number out of there. It may not triple it, it may double it or whatever. I go, okay, at 5,000, then who's going to be buying all this gold? Well, that, then five thousand dollars gold is not going to last that long, right? So, the, the of course, the argument is, of course me? the argument might be at that time is is that that time lag for it to catch up, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Um, so, um, so gold is going higher, and I could say right now, gold's going to five thousand dollars an ounce. But you basically take sixteen hundred and fifty dollars today, and you just go, okay, the inflation over the next. 20 years or 30 years, whatever inflation rate you want to put in there. And that's when gold is most likely going to cross that. Mm-hmm. And there's there's economic fundamentals behind it. Because guess what? Uh, when Barrick's mining gold in uh, in Nevada, 
price of diesel fuel matters, the price of electricity matters, the price of those yellow trucks matters, the price of labor matters, and all that stuff is heading up in the price of inflation. And if gold price does not keep up to that, those mines will get shut down, the supply will be constrained, then is um, then with supply constrained, the price of gold will start going back up again. But it's all around this, this trend line and, and periodically gold will be way above the trend line or way below the trend line. Trying to predict that, I don't think is the way to make money. Just, uh, I, I and again, I've made money by finding really good gold companies that are are making big discoveries, and those are the ones you want to be involved in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, thinking about how, let's say, the, the market behaves when, you know, large hedge funds start jumping into these markets and, and snapping up the, maybe even down to some of these crappy companies as you were talking about. Yeah. What, what turn do you think we need maybe we can take uranium the, the uranium market and the gold market as as two separate thoughts here but you know everybody thinks that the price of gold is going to be completely dependent on the fed pivoting at this point do you think that that's going to drive hedge fund interest into smaller gold companies is is the fed pivoting you know smaller gold companies i've watched american investors especially the bigger ones get smoked so many times in the canadian junior gold market that, uh, you know, I think they probably learned their lesson. But there's probably a few newbies out there who haven't let yet, haven't learned their lesson yet. So they'll they'll learn that lesson. You know, I, the uh, the junior golds are a really tricky market. Like I watched a lot of people get laid out over the years, right? I don't want to name names, but during the 90s, there were two big mutual fund managers who ran billion dollar funds in the junior gold space well they started at probably 50 million or 80 million and then gold got overhyped during the you know the whole Briax era and and so what happened there was they instead of capping their fund at 300 million they took it to a billion plus and uh, then when the gold market turned and they got redemptions try selling junior gold stocks into a declining market to meet redemptions in your mutual fund and they just blew blew up mm-hmm. it's also happened fairly re- recently too with a few other funds um they all learn the same lessons they they get too big and they blow themselves up and there's lots of blow-ups in in the junior gold market i could think of probably four right off the top of my head i could think of four right off the top of me i bet you there's five or six i could think of with a little bit of thought yeah mm-hmm. And those are nice big funds that just vaporized. So you're not, you don't think that funds will move into the, let's say, the gold or uranium space? Well, not in the juniors, right? So, and, you know, I found recently too, versus the 90s, is now with the advent of ETFs, a lot of the guys in the US will just buy the ETF, right? And I think that's a wise move. If you're, if you're that bullish on them, again, it's not the way I'd ever play play the market, but you know, at least you're not stuck in the ABC Junior Moose Pasture Junior, where uh, the stock trades, you know, 100 shares a day and you own 20 million shares of it, right? So mm-hmm. the, the junior gold market is a very dangerous place for anybody with any size of capital. You've got to be very nimble and really understand liquidity and really understand what you've got and how you're going to exit the position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So where do you think those funds or, or any of that bigger, you know, if we can call it smart money, where, where do you think they start to enter the market, let's say in the, in the mid caps and the, and the producers? Yeah, they'll have to play like the big, the big money c- cannot play the juniors and the juniors. Why retail loves them so much is if you're playing with small amounts of money, you can get five and 10 baggers reasonably easy. You're not going to get that on uh, with many of the, with the mid tiers and the, in the, the seniors, right? So I think the big the big guys know that and they know they can't play in the illiquid market. So they'll if they for some reason want to get long commodities, if they think there's a big inflationary uh, boom coming um, and let's say for whatever reason they're bullish on gold, uh, they generally stick with the big liquid names and and some of the mid tiers, too. So. um, But, you know, again, like I said, uh, I would not play that game because you're you're just when you're buying a barrack, you're basically just taking a punt on the price of gold, in my opinion. So, Mm -hmm. you have obviously some, you know, controversial opinions around not necessarily 
being an uber bull on the on, on the major macro cycle of these of the underlying commodities. So, you know, how do you see, let's say this this narrative also that we see around the battery metals? Is that is that something that you think is is quite overblown? Yeah, well, there's a lot of people jumping into battery metals who don't know much about mining, right? So they're saying, well, you know, uh, I believe the future's in electric vehicles. We're going to need we're going to need nickel, cobalt, lithium, copper to make these batteries, right? So, well, I better buy some cobalt. Well, guess what? Cobalt's the the one that I hate the most. Uh, <laughs> Cobalt's an amazing metal. It does a lot of amazing things. It's from uh, an interesting country. Congo represents, you know, 70% of the world production of it. But guess what? The world will not be beholden to Congo uh, going forward for battery metals, right? It's just too concentrated a location. And cobalt's generally produced as a byproduct of copper. Fortunately, there'll be a lot of demand for copper, so there should be a fair amount of cobalt coming at us. But I believe right now every single battery engineer in the entire world is trying to engineer out cobalt. Mm -hmm. So when the cobalt took a run, a short-lived run here not that long ago, my view is that's ridiculous. Um, everybody's going to be engineering out cobalt. There's no way. It's just too the, – the supply chain is just too uh, unstable. We're not going to bet the future of the world's – electrification on the Congo and whether we can get cobalt out of the Congo, right? And then it's it's reasonably expensive. Some hedge funds out of the US tripled the price of, of uh, cobalt. But you can you imagine, you know, I'm in the mining business. Let's say I even had a good cobalt project today. By the time I, I did the studies, got it permitted, got it built, the chemistry of the battery metals will be completely different in eight to 10 years time, right? So that's where I think it's kind of nutty to be betting on things like that. On the battery metals front, what would I bet on? I would bet on, um, I think if you are out there looking for copper mines, that's not a bad thing. Sure, copper's dropped from 450 to 350 short term here, but long term, one has to think that if we're electrifying, we're gonna need more copper. So copper is probably not the worst place in the world. And um, one of the trickiest metals I've found in my career to find is uh, high quality nickel sulfide. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, I'm working on that right now. That's probably my number one priority, or one of my top priorities, anyways. Is uh, I've I've uh, I'm doing due diligence now on a nickel sulfide project, which I think is extraordinary. And nickel nickel sulfide was rare before the uh the advent of electric vehicles and that rarity is not going to go away so i really like just general looking for copper looking for nickel i think those are good good metals the world is going to need and if i could latch in like i said on the discovery cycle and back some good people who have a good urine a good uh, nickel project they're able to build the tonnage i will i'm going to be all over that and i think i found that and uh I'm, I'm just have not done a site visit yet, and there's a few more things I want to uh, look into before I start, you know, jumping on the on the roof and start telling people to buy um, buy it. Like, like I did probably the last time I did that in a big way was really with Next Gen. Mm -hmm. I pounded the table as hard as I could to get people to buy Next Gen, and it was a big winner for those who who uh, owned a little bit of it. Yeah. So Warren, when we see this this price run up, when when things start getting frothy and exciting, are there any particular, let's say, rules that you have around when you're going to be taking some profits off the table? Are there, you know, any particular price levels or volume levels that you want to see? Is it the you know the proverbial headline on the the Financial Times, for example? Are those the times that you're looking to start taking profits off the table? Yeah, you know, for me, um, it's more of a feel because a lot of this, let's say when you're when you're behind a commodity that's on a big run, right? A lot of it is is emotion, right? As a lot of it is fear of missing out, and there's a lot of emotion, and uh, there's emotions from people around the world. Let's say jump. Let's say copper has a nice big run to six bucks, and you're going to have a lot of people getting really excited about copper. And then when I take a look at that level of excitement. And then I, I, 
And if I've made a bunch of money and I feel really good, I feel really, you know, I've done well. That's generally when I like to take profits off because whether you like it or not, the mining cycle is extraordinarily cyclical and you'll be able to buy that copper, the bottom of the downturn, when everybody, all the Americans who jumped into the copper cycle have all run back to New York with the tail between their legs uh, being laid out in the copper market. And then you just go and you pick up the pieces, right? And uh, there's a lot of money. There's there's money to be made doing that. And um, so, but generally, whenever I feel good about a position I've made and I've made a lot of money about it, uh, that's a really good sign. That's the first sign you should really start letting some go. And again, you don't need to sell it all of it at once. Sell a little bit as you're feeling, you know, sell a quarter, sell a quarter, sell a quarter, get an average, and uh, I think you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the worst danger you have is if you start believing the narrative. Like if copper is at six bucks and you, you're not thinking about, well, look at all the copper mines that are going to be economic at six bucks copper all around the world and all that production when it hits in a few more years time. You're thinking, well, the big narrative, you know, and Al Gore says electric vehicles are doing this and this and this, and I got to buy the narrative. And Elon Musk is telling the world to go out there and look for copper and to, to electrify the world. If you buy into that that narrative and that nonsense, that's the way you're going to lose some dough. And uh, so, um, I, you know, you, you don't want to jump in there with the crowd. And right now, that's part of the reason I'm a little cautious in uranium is the crowd's getting behind uranium and the crowd is desperately trying to push uranium higher. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm ready to hit the sell button and sell into that manic crowd that wants to buy my uh, next gen at a price that'll be, uh, that I'm, I'm happy to sell at. Mm -hmm. So obviously you've had a, a, a pretty long career within the, you know, the, the mining community Let's let's just say. So, do you see the let's say the the advent of this the ESG mandate that a lot of these companies developing as a as a good thing as being positive for the the mining community? And maybe share your thoughts on on how that has maybe changed that ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's one of the nuttiest things I've seen ever to hit the mining industry, um, and uh, the. Um, it's it's crazy. Like uh, we're seeing, I'll give you an example of a big company that's doing nutty things as a result of ESG. All right, so let's take a look at steel making. Right, in order to make steel, you need iron ore and you need metallurgical coal. Right, that's the current. It's it's been over a hundred years. That's how we've made steel. Right, mm -hmm. but all the all the environmental zealots are saying, well, you know, we can't be using coal to make steel. Well, guess what? We've had hundreds and hundreds of steel plants around the world that, that do it that way. Well, they're saying, well, you need to use hydrogen. Well, they're going, okay, well, hydrogen. There's a new process. Oh, sorry, so we're going to retrofit over the next while all the steel plants in the world to hydrogen. Well, where's the source of that hydrogen? How did you generate that hydrogen? Oh, you used coal-fired power plants to make the hydrogen. <laughs> so does it really matter if you burn it in the steel making process or to make the power to produce the hydrogen? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of fantasy out there. And a lot of big U.S. institutions have bought into the fantasy, and they're putting pressure on companies to do really stupid things. So, example, um, you know, I don't know what tech's going to do here, but here's tech as a company is making a significant amount of its profits out of metallurgical coal. They make great, high-quality metallurgical coal that's needed in the world. Guess what? To build wind farms, to build solar panels, to build Teslas, you need steel. And, and tech produces the met coal high quality in a jurisdiction where we're not using child labor or anything. And it produces the, the met coal to make this steel for the electrification of the world. But tech is under pressure by a number of big institutions. You got to be green, sell off your met coal. Well, so how does that help the world by them selling their met coal assets to ABC met coal company that's going to produce for the next 30 years that met coal needed for the steel industry until the steel industry switches to a technique that will use less or could produce less co2 mm -hmm. so they're just they're just horse trading and a lot of these guys that are running these big companies are politicians and they just say okay well if uh if uh you know blackstone says i, I can't be producing met coal i better sell it or you know and it's the most ridiculous thing i've seen in the world and you saw this recently it's 
come back at us with respect to the oil business, right? Like just the U.S. being anti-oil, and now they're going, they're giving Saudis grief for cutting oil production by two million barrels a day. Well, I said, well, why why aren't we producing that in North America? Oh, it's because you guys are all anti-pipeline and anti-oil that you're not producing it here in North America. But then you get mad at the Saudis when they cut back on their oil production. The world is completely crazy as soon as you start getting these politicians and do-gooders involved in the supply chain of of metals and mining and oil and energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, frankly, the the consequences of it are are ridiculous. Because right now, if I would... If I was sitting on a billion dollars, what would I be doing? I would be buying tax met coal assets. And I'd be buying all these met coal assets these guys will be selling to you at a super great deal. And I'll keep it in a private company. So I don't care what you know what any, any of the big US institutions that have an ESG man- mandate are saying. And I'll be producing that, that met coal and I'll be making an absolute fortune. And how does that help the world? It doesn't help the world. But how is that but but you know. Some people think they're doing good by switching met coal assets from, let's say, a company like Tech to some other company to produce those same met coal assets. Like, I don't know. And and North America somehow thinks it's good. Let's shut down our oil production and buy oil from the Saudis. Like, in the whole scheme of things, we all live on the same planet, and that doesn't help. So um, it's the ESG movement is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. and. It's completely and totally outrageous, and um, the consequences are ridiculous. And uh, yeah, and I, I view Met Coal, for instance, as just one of the metals uh, or one of the products. It's not unlike thirty years ago. I saw this when I was a, a young punk kid starting out in corporate finance, and uh, you know everybody was anti-tobacco, so. All the big pension funds said, oh, we have a mandate not to invest in tobacco because tobacco is bad. Well, guess what? Here we are 30 years later, still a significant number of people smoking cigarettes. But guess what? Do you know how much money has been made in tobacco the last 30 years? The dividends, the amount of dough. And there's nothing these tobacco companies could do. Like the people people smoke, and I, I know smokers, and they they know they shouldn't be smoking, but they're still smoking. And I ask them, I say, why, you know? I care for you. Why are you smoking? I'd really rather have you look after your health, but people keep smoking. And uh, for the last 30 years, the people that own those tobacco companies, while they were shunned by all the do-getters in the world, made an absolute fortune. So I think the people, we're going to see that a little bit here. In We're going to see it in Metcoal for sure. And I know of some parties right now globally that are doing indeed doing that and setting up a private company to buy all these unloved coal projects. And they're going to make a fortune on them. And, you know, what do you do? That's uh, the nuttiness of the world sometimes. And um, Absolutely. It's going to be it's going to be used anyway. It's still needed at this time. Yes. And it doesn't seem to be changing at a at a staggeringly rapid pace. Right. No, exactly. And, you know, I'm I'm a citizen of the earth. I would love to have another uh, source of uh, non CO2 generating steel but that's not the case now and it's going to take decades for us to get there so that that's being real it's being real it's not being fantasy mm-hmm. and you're seeing this fantasy land bite the germans in the butt right now uh they'll the, each german will as this as the cold goes through their bodies this winter they'll understand the the dangers of believing in fantasy and the fantasy that wind and solar is going to power their future. That's not, it's not. And shutting down their nuclear power plants was not a good thing to do. And they finally figured that one out. And like there, there's a lot of nuttiness going on. It's just like here in Canada. We have this tremendous oil resource. We're selling it super cheap to the Americans, cheaper than we would if we were able to export it to, to international markets. We have stranded natural gas, which selfishly i'd rather keep it stranded because it keeps my gas bills down but in theory if if we were smart as canadians we would export that as L- in lng mm-hmm. and we'd get much higher prices for our gas producers we generate more taxes for our country um but there's a lot of nutty stuff going on uh, blocking of the pipelines you know 
blocking of LNG facilities. And uh, it's there's a lot of nutty stuff going on. Well, unfortunately, I think it's going to take some some pain to learn those lessons, and hopefully, we can learn them sooner than later before we have to face, you know, maybe a, a situation like Germany is going to be facing this winter, right? Yeah. So hopefully, uh, they'll be the poster child. They were right out there in front doing the solar thing, right? Solar in Germany. I couldn't imagine a, a stupider place to have solar, <laughs> but you know, solar in Germany. Somebody got behind that, and they spent hundreds of billions of dollars on it. And here they are today. They're going to be freezing this winter, not unlike the Texans when they froze a few winters ago and people were dying of, you know, dying in in, um, in Texas not that long ago because there wasn't enough heat. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of nutty stuff going on. My favorite one is the, another poster child for stupidity is the, the state of California where... Um, you know, not what is it loud this past summer? They're going, well, okay, we're you know, the state of California is going to be a fun one to watch because they, they have the highest uh, concentration of electric vehicles. And they basically said this past summer, okay, you have a choice. You want air conditioning or you want to charge your electric vehicles? Or they were telling people, please don't charge your electric vehicles because the air the demand for electricity because the air conditioning is too and I'm going, are we trusting <laughs> is California trusting Pacific Gas and Electric? For their greenification of the state of California, it's another completely nutty thing of when nutty stuff happens. And, you know, of course, I'm sure you'll have the all the environmentalists in California being totally against building a nuclear power plant in California. But guess what? California needs a nuclear power plant and it needs a considerable amount of money spent on the grid if they're going to live their fantasy future of having both air conditioning and electric cars. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. I remember uh, this summer, it was the exact, the, the same week they came out with an announcement that they were going to be cutting off all internal combustion engine sales by, I think it was 2030 or 2035. And that very same week, they said that people can't be charging their electric cars because there's going to be brownouts and blackouts because they don't have enough power. Yeah. And if they continue on that stupid fashion, California is just going to be like Cuba, (laughs) meaning in 20 years, you're going to go to California and everybody's driving an internally internal combustion engine that's 20 years old, just like the 1950 Chevys are still driving in Havana. Mm -hmm. It'll be crazy because for somebody to take away my internal combustion car until I'm convinced there's even a sufficient energy and networks to charge some your. I'm not selling an internal combustion car. No way. Can you imagine being in California and putting your tr- and selling your internal combustion car that you can't buy back new again, right? Mm-hmm. Trusting Pacific Gas Electric to supply that electricity to drive it? Are you kidding? That is very trusting. Mm-hmm. I would not trust them given the amount of screw-ups we've seen globally from Germany, Texas, California, uh, you name it. <laughs> And the the real shame here about this whole electrical revolution, which I think would be fantastic for Los Angeles to clean up the air there, right? It would be amazing to go to Los Angeles without the smog. Mm -hmm. But um, it's absolutely nutty what's what's happening here um, with respect to uh, electrification. And uh, I I had a really interesting example here. I live in a condo. I have a condo in Toronto, right? So my condo board contacted me and said, Warren, do you want to put an electric charger in your in your parking garage? And I'm going, oh, no, I have no plans of buying an electric vehicle because there's not a single one I would like to own right now. And um, and I don't want to pay in, you know, these ridiculous prices for them. So I'll just sit tight. You know, I'll probably get one in five or 10 years, uh, maybe. So they said, then then I get a little tip off. They go, Warren. You got to put a charger in. I said, why is that? And I said, well, we've just spoken with this Toronto Hydro and they cannot provide our building with any more additional hydro. So anybody, so the people that put in electric chargers now could be the last group of people in our entire condo building that can get an electric charger. So here mm-hmm. we are, imagine 20 years from now when the government of Ontario has outlawed the sale of internal combustion cars. But I'm living in a condo where only, you know, 20% of the condo residents could charge their vehicles. The rest 
because there's no capacity going to the condo building and the Toronto Hydro can't provide it. Mm -hmm. There's some nutty stuff coming down the road here. (laughs) And the biggest travesty, right, is at least with internal combustion engines, who supplies me the gasoline to put in them? Imperial Oil, let's say. Imperial Oil uh, or uh, Shell. They're private companies. Mm -hmm. We are now giving the power to provide uh, the fuel we need for our cars, not for free enterprise, but to Pacific Gas and Electric, Toronto Hydro. These nutty, big bureaucratic organizations are supposed to supposed to move with market forces to provide us all with enough electricity to not only live our lives, to power our factories, but also drive our cars. Mm-hmm. That is not something I'm going to be really super excited about betting, betting on because I have a sneaky suspicion they're going to screw it up as bad as on a bigger scale. Germany screwed up their, their greenification. Mm-hmm. And well, so, like you, like like you mentioned earlier, uh, California being an example of somebody something that <clears throat> the feel good policies have had unintended consequences. There's there's parts of California that look a lot worse than Cuba at this point. And as unfortunate as that is, again, that's that's pain that's going to be felt all around these these policies that have consequences that people you know, despite thinking they're great, end up causing these, let's say, homeless encampments. Oh, yeah, the homeless issue is a is a whole new one, right? Like that's, uh, yeah, wow, wow. You know, the whole the whole issue behind homelessness. Holy mackerel, that's a trick. That's a tricky one, and I I think about it quite often. And uh, there's no ease of solutions to that one, I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, the future. Uh, the future is very fascinating, and uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm not turning over my keys in my diesel-powered pickup truck quite yet. <laughs> well, Warren, I think that's a good place to kind of wrap up today's conversation. Unless you had anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? No, I think I've. I'm sure I've ruffled <laughs> enough feathers, Tom, for one day. But <laughs> well, I appreciate you sharing your your thoughts with us on how you how you look at the world and trying to you know appreciate some capital that you have and the ways that you've that you've done that i appreciate you sharing that with us very welcome i hope you enjoyed it thanks a lot tom absolutely of course if there's anybody that wants to get a, a hold of warren he's available at rosso r-o-s-s-e-a-u.com right yeah thank Perfect. you very much thanks for your time today warren thanks tom cheers This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.